Namco's Pac-Man is often referred to as the world's first video game character. And while that may or may not be true, it's certain that he was the first really popular one. But since his 1980 debut, popular figures in gaming have been a dime a dozen, and most games today almost always feature a recognizable hero or heroine. Some characters become fan favorites, but are relatively forgotten about shortly after their time in the limelight is up. Other characters remain relevant for decades after their debut by regularly starring in new games. But then there are those few gaming icons whose popularity endures despite the lack of modern hits or being neglected by their creators, one of which is another of Namco's characters. Valkyrie Episode 25 of Import Gaming for the Win took a look at the character's origins with a 1986 Famicom action RPG, The Adventure of Valkyrie, The Legend of the Key of Time. While that was a popular title in the era, Valkyrie herself wouldn't truly be established as a gaming icon until three years later with the release of the next chapter of the series. Originally intended to be called Warukure no Boken, Ogo no Tane, or The Adventure of Valkyrie, The Golden Seed, its name was changed during development to Warukure no Densets, or simply The Legend of Valkyrie. Rather than develop a sequel for home consoles or computers, Namco instead opted to build The Legend of Valkyrie from the ground up as an arcade game, running on their famed System 2 arcade board, a piece of hardware that also powered such classics as Felios, Cosmo Gang the Video, and the incredible shooting and driving game, Lucky and Wild. The shift from console to arcade cabinet also meant a drastic change in gameplay from Valkyrie's Famicom debut. Legend retains the visual style and many of the same characters and enemies from Adventure, but that's where most of the similarities end. A free-roaming action RPG wasn't much of a fit for the fast-paced world of arcade games, so Namco decided to make The Legend of Valkyrie a more linear action game complemented by light role-playing and adventure elements. And although it sports a swords and sorcery fantasy setting, this game feels more like a run-and-gun shooter than anything else. I think a good comparison would be the Kiki Kai Kai series. The Legend of Valkyrie takes place once again in Marvel Land, this time divided into 8 stages, and can be played solo or cooperatively with a friend. Player 1 is of course Valkyrie, and Player 2 takes control of Kurino Sandro, the pudgy green fellow whom Valkyrie saved in the original game. Both play exactly the same, and the only differences between Valkyrie and Kurino are visual. In contrast to its cryptic predecessor, this game has a pretty well-defined story that is mostly told through short cutscenes in between stages, and to a lesser extent, by speaking with NPCs and enemies. Not much backstory is given in-game other than a brief monologue from the goddess, who speaks of a golden seed that once brought happiness to the people of Marvel Land, but is now the source of terrible conflict, and asks Valkyrie to help bring peace to the world once again. Valkyrie dives from the heavens to the earth in a dramatic leap, signaling the start of another legendary adventure. The setup for the story leaves much to be desired. However, the June 1989 edition of the Namco Community Magazine NG made Valkyrie's second grand adventure its cover story, and with that came a short prologue to the game, accompanied by some cool illustrations. This prelude to The Legend of Valkyrie would eventually be expanded upon in greater detail with an 80-page book published in 1991 titled Valkyrie Storybook. At the conclusion of the event which took place in The Adventure of Valkyrie, peace was at long last restored to Marvel Land. Kurino Sandra, who aided Valkyrie in her quest to seal away the evil dark wizard Zona into the Abyss of Time, returned home to his family in Sandra Land where they would experience happiness and prosperity for years to come. At least, that's what should have happened. Though quite isolated from other kingdoms, Sandraland was always self-sustaining due to its rich soil and abundance in natural resources. But not long after Valkyrie and Kurino's epic adventure, the lush Sandraland became barren, and the earth no longer yielded the much-needed crops that the Sandra people depended on to live. To save his family, his village, and his people, Kurino embarks on a new adventure, this time in search of the legendary Golden Seed, a mystical item that is said to grant the wish of whomever tosses it into the Northern Spring. The journey begins as a solitary one, 
but that soon changes as Kurino is joined by a couple of companions. The first is a young member of the Quarkman tribe named Sabina, whose extraordinary agility proves very helpful in evading dangers lurking in the wild. The second person to join up is a man named Zuli Zulkovich Kozluinen, or Zul for short, who is in possession of a treasure map that may just lead the trio to the hidden location of the Golden Seed. The map first leads them to discover a golden artifact, but not the seed. Rather, it's a trident which becomes Kurino's signature weapon, as its size and weight seem perfectly crafted for a green-skinned Sandra. Shortly one evening after the discovery of this relic, the group encounters a wise old woman who directs them to visit the ruins of a small village where a terrible tragedy had taken place in the not-too-distant past. As they investigate the premises, they are met by a hostile force of soldiers united under the banner of the vicious warlord Camus, who is responsible for spreading chaos across the land in his own quest to find the Golden Seed. These soldiers threaten and harass Kurino, Sabina, and Zul, and just as the situation takes a violent turn for the worse, a glimmer of hope peers from the sky above. It's Valkyrie once again making a descent from the clouds to rid Marvelland of that which threatens the peace. The reunion between old comrades. The Golden Seed. The Legend of Valkyrie. The game itself picks up very loosely where this prologue ended, starting the players off in Sandra Land. There's only one path for our heroes to follow, which is up the stone trail. Each character can move in 8 directions using the joystick, and it's not long until Valkyrie and Kurino are ambushed by hostile forces, boomerang wielding Tata Barbarians, whom players of the Adventure of Valkyrie may remember from that game's first enemy encounter. You can deal with these foes simply with the tap of a single button, which executes each character's standard projectile attack. Further up ahead you'll reach a swamp and be confronted by fly drills, winged apes that also make a comeback from adventure. In fact, a large chunk of this game's roster of adversaries are carryovers from the original. To mention just a few more, the fiery Honarians that made dungeons a pain in the first game are here, sometimes laying in wait to surprise the heroes as they open treasure chests. Zona's mechanical minions will fire out laser beams and require extra effort to take out for good. And the giant scissor-like monsters that acted as sub-bosses serve the same role here, occupying sand pits and spitting out clumps of dirt sporadically in bursts. The swamp is home to hungry crocodiles, but thankfully our heroes also have the ability to jump, so they can hop across the murky waters using giant lily pads and avoid the danger that lies beneath. One button performs the jump move, the height, distance, and direction of which can be controlled by long and short button presses in combination with the joystick. Moving along, you'll encounter a young girl named Mei, tied up in being violently interrogated about the Golden Seed by a member of Kamuza's horde, a red demon. When confronted, he kicks the girl off to the side and turns his attention elsewhere by splitting into multiple forms and spitting out deadly fireballs as he dances around the heroes. After extinguishing the fiery menace, Mei will ask you to come to her house, which is just across the water. As a token of gratitude for rescuing her daughter, you're awarded by Mei's mother with the Sword of Light, which is actually the first weapon upgrade of the game. With this, Valkyrie and Kurino's attack will now be a large and powerful energy shot. Later on you'll find other upgrades, including a 3-way shot, a 4-way shot, a penetrating drill shot, a wide beam, a homing shot, and bombs. Each of these have their own pros and cons, but are all a big step up from the default attack, which becomes pretty ineffective in later levels. Unfortunately, every upgrade is limited to a certain number of shots, and once they're up, it's back to the standard projectile. Unless you have more upgrades in your current inventory. Weapon upgrades become scarce in later levels, but thankfully you can permanently upgrade the standard attack by acquiring a secret weapon called the Eternal Sword in level 3. Anyway, after receiving your reward, Mei's mother tells you to visit the wise woman, referred to as Baba-sama, who is currently residing in a hut further west. She'll greet you warmly with praise, 
But more importantly than that, she'll also teach you the first magic ability in the game, the Option Spell. Each time it's cast, it will create smaller versions of Valkyrie and Kurino that follow their every move and attack for a short time, much like options found in shooting games such as Gradius. Magic can be used by holding down the attack button, which brings up a menu that allows you to cycle through all of your spells, all completely different from those found in the Adventure of Valkyrie. New magic attacks are taught by other wise women who are found off the beaten track in nearly every stage, and there are six total. Aside from the option spell, there's the Cyclone spell, an attack that sends out a spiraling wave of energy that damages all enemies in the area. The next one you'll learn is the Big Spell, which transforms Valkyrie and Kurino into giants, giving them larger and more powerful attacks, as well as the added bonus of causing shockwave damage with every leap they make. The Tornado Magic turns the heroes into twirling tops of terror with each use, and the Chameleon spell will cause a majority of enemies to devolve into easy-to-kill weaklings. The last spell in the game is also the most difficult to obtain, and can only be used one single time. It allows the heroes to fly, essentially, by letting them hover during a jump for a short, fixed period of time. That might not seem very useful on paper, but in the final area leading up to Camus, use of this spell is very handy for bypassing the most challenging platforming section of the game. Every spell consumes a different amount of MP, represented by orbs on the HUD, and some can also be cast together, resulting in deadly combinations. For example, while under the supersizing effects of the big magic, you can use the option spell to create an army of minions equal to the normal size of Valkyrie or Kurino, which makes most boss fights ridiculously quick and easy. A nifty extra feature of this game's magic system is that you'll be invulnerable for a brief period when you bring up the menu, which can be used to avoid certain attacks when timed correctly. Heading north and continuing up the path, you'll run into Zul, the man who accompanied Kurino on his travels in the prologue. However, fans of the first game will likely remember him as the annoying thief character who would rob Valkyrie of her items. In that time, perhaps Zona's dark magic was to blame for his nefarious actions. But whatever the case, he's given up his thieving ways, and now provides travelers with useful items. For a cost, of course. Gold coins and money bags are found when defeating enemies or opening treasure chests, and are used exclusively at Zul's shops, which are set up in different areas throughout each level. He offers a different selection of weapon power-ups that change in variety and price with each visit, but he also sells other very useful items. There are one-time use items to recover health and magic, as well as the large heart and magic book, which permanently increase the player's maximum HP or MP by one, up to six total for each. The only downside to them is that each one takes up a permanent slot in Valkyrie and Kurino's inventory, which will limit or even prevent collection of weapon upgrades if completely filled. Also, these items cannot be discarded once picked up, so you must carefully manage your pickups to avoid being underpowered, especially at later levels when weapon upgrades are pretty essential in combating stronger enemies. An hourglass will extend the game timer and has the potential to be a literal lifesaver, because like most other arcade games, running out of time in a level brings with it a penalty, and in the case of The Legend of Valkyrie, it's the reduction of one whole heart. A particularly interesting item he sells is a special formal dress and suit, which alter the character sprites and supposedly restore HP and MP gradually, but I've never confirmed this because I haven't been able to hold onto the item for very long, since it disappears the next time the heroes take any type of damage. All of Zul's wares can also be found in treasure chests or as boss drops, so you're never forced to buy a health or magic upgrade to max out your stats. After making your purchases, heading up further north has our heroes climb Mount Alsandra, which is emphasized with a cool scaling effect, much like the one used in the start of the game. It may not look like a big deal today, but in 1989, this was quite the graphical feat. In a later stage, this effect is taken to the extreme at a castle which utilizes spoon catapults that launch the heroes high into the sky, giving a breathtaking view of the game world. The path up the mountain is dangerous, but not only due to belligerent forces that have taken position along the trail. No, you'll have to dodge logs and boulders rolling down the hill as well. Environmental hazards are found all throughout Marvel Land, 
and in addition to causing a bit of damage to each character, produced some pretty humorous animations as well. Eventually, the mountain path comes to an end, and you'll have to hop onto moving platforms to proceed in a section that contains imagery that is quite iconic of the Valkyrie series. Platforming in this game isn't frustrating thanks to the excellent controls, and also because falling into pits or deep water results simply in a small hit to your HP and returning to the last stable ground you touched, a very lenient punishment. These platforms will take you to a floating island that is home to a small building, and it's inside where you'll encounter the first boss of the game, the Twin Gilas. This two-headed monster was an optional sub-boss in the Adventure of Valkyrie, so it's nice to see yet another element of the original game make a return. The Twin Gilas will constantly move around the narrow constraints of the building, using two attacks, generating lightning projectiles from the horns on one of its heads, and ramming into the player with the other head. While the odds certainly seem stacked against you, this battle is not much of a challenge, and can be over in mere seconds if using the option magic wisely. Defeating the twin Gilas will reward the heroes with the Golden Seed. What a surprise to find it this early on in the quest, huh? Victory also means freeing the Wind Fairy who instructs Valkyrie and Kurino to take the seed to the Northern Spring and toss it in to end the chaos that has taken over Marvel Land. To reach their destination, the duel will traverse the fiery depths, the vast ocean, and the frozen tundra, conquering fearsome beasts and rescuing the remaining elemental fairies, earth, light, and water. While the first level of the game is completely linear, other levels allow free exploration of large areas of the map and even have branching paths. Once the fairies have reunited, they will guide Valkyrie and Kurino to the Northern Spring, which is hidden by a rainbow-colored aurora. All that lies between them and the aurora is a sea of glaciers and one final obstacle, the colossal Sphinma, who forces the heroes to go through one of two trials before they carry on. The trial of strength requires victory against some intimidating foes, and the Trial of Intelligence challenges them to a series of slide puzzles. The choice is yours, and upon completion of either trial, you are granted access to the Aurora, an ethereal door which is unlocked only by holding up the sacred weapons given to the heroes by the elemental fairies. Unfortunately, it turns out that Camus and the remainder of his forces have made it to the spring before Valkyrie and Kurino, and it will take all the duel has in them to push through the formidable enemies lying in wait. When it seems there is no foe left standing, they meet the final challenger at the northern spring, who is none other than the fearsome warlord of this army himself, Camus. He'll waste no time in attacking the would-be saviors of Marvel Land, utilizing each of his four massive arms for a different task in the battle. One shoots out fireballs, another defends with a shield, a third throws boomerangs, while the last goes for a hard-hitting punch. Camus is extremely aggressive and always on the move, so the heroes will need to be equally as aggressive and on the move in order to take him down. As the battle rages on, his appearance will change to become even more twisted, revealing what is most likely his true form. Regardless of his ghastly appearance, Camus differs from the previous scourge of Marvel Land, Zona, as he is a mere mortal, made of flesh and bone, and can be taken down with conventional battle tactics. Defeating Camus means the end of chaos and the return of order to the world. It also means the fulfillment of Valkyrie's duty calling for her to part ways with her cherished companions. In one magnificent leap, she thrusts herself into the air to return to her place in the sky, another chapter concluded in the Valkyrie Saga. If beaten in co-op mode, the players are treated to an extended ending showing Kurino waving his friend farewell, and the people of Marvel Land happily celebrating the newfound peace. The ending screen also changes depending on player performance with fairies and the goddess making appearances related to different milestones that were achieved during the playthrough. The Legend of Valkyrie is not a very difficult game, 
especially when compared to other similar titles of the era, and is a bit on the brief side, clocking in at just about one hour from start to finish. I own a VHS walkthrough of this game, which shows that it can be beaten in nearly half that time and in one life with enough skill. But even if it is a bit easy and short, it's quite the fulfilling experience that will certainly remain in the memories of those who have played it, and is definitely worthy of its legendary reputation and moniker. It has that classic, easy to pick up and play arcade feeling to it that is accessible to just about anyone, though there is a small language barrier here for those who can't read Japanese. A certain section of the game requires the player to correctly answer a question from an NPC in order to advance, and the question he asks is random and shuffled around, but it is definitely possible to get past this section by guessing, as the only penalty for choosing the wrong response is a production of hit points. For those lacking the language skills to get past this part without relying on blind luck, and for those who want to get the most out of the game's story and dialogue, there is a solution in the form of an official English translation in one of the several ports that were made of The Legend of Valkyrie. But I'll talk about those in an upcoming episode of Import Gaming for the Win. That's right, The Legend of Valkyrie Part 2, The Port. So instead of a three-parter on the Valkyrie series, it looks like it's gonna be four. Keep an eye out for them, or else, Kamuz's terrorists win. Anyway, thank you for watching this episode, and until next time, this is Jimmy Hoppa. Take care.